Welcome in to the Husker 24-7 podcast on a Sunday after a newsy Saturday that featured Nebraska's defensive tackle getting a pin on the wrestling mat, a former head coach cheering him on, the entire staff that was basically there at the wrestling meet. Oh, and by the way, Nebraska picked up a couple commitments this weekend as well out of the transfer portal. Lots of stuff happening here in Lincoln with the Nebraska football team. So what better time to bring in the experts and talk about what's going on with Husker football. So welcome in Michael Brunts, Brian Christofferson. Gentlemen, how's your weekend going? Not bad. Not bad. It's uh it's good that you're getting kind of the you're you're getting the two ways in the portal now. You get you're getting guys that are coming out of the portal, which is good. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, this, this brings them up to three editions for the year. Filling filling needs and adding dudes. That's what you're doing. <clears throat> yeah, you had a kind of lonely you had a like a, a p- ongoing fluid portal chart you're running, uh, Bronze, and it was kind of lonely. It was all leaving and and nobody entering. And it's nice. It's nice that the doors open here. Yeah, yeah. You're like one of those Midwest uh, Rust Belt cities. Nobody's actually coming to live there, and everyone's leaving to go somewhere else. Yeah, we're but now you've been revitalized downtown. We're Pittsburgh. Everybody's coming back. Everybody's wearing their pressed, finally pressed Greg Lloyd jerseys. They're feeling good. They're coming back to the city. Mm-hmm. Yeah, although good. you weren't, although Bruns, your list doesn't count the uh, the Husker portal as Rule referred to it right after the uh, I in his signing day press conference. That's the guys like Gifford, and you should have yeah. like a Husker portal. <laughs> yeah, um, Gifford, that's, Ben Hart, oh, Ty Robinson, man. Nash. It's maybe an alternative portal, like you go over here. That it's portal's like, getting shut down for good at the end of what twenty twenty five. So there's there's a a finite life of that portal based on uh, you know the end of the the free COVID year, which I will happily look forward to. One more question before we get started. So guys that started, what are we doing? Yeah, I know guys, guys that like, let's say two years ago went in the portal and they never had anywhere that they went. Like they never found anywhere to go. Are they still in there or do they like, (laughs) can they kind of like, it's like Christmas. You pick everything up, you put it away for the year and then you get it back out the next year. Or, Or are there still guys like, is there like a defensive back with like a year left of eligibility that's just been like sitting in that portal for two years? It could be like a very modern Twilight Zone uh, episode for a very niche audience, like yeah. uh, get guys who get stuck in the uh, transfer portal. Yeah. Um, I would definitely watch that for forty minutes, though, if someone came up with a clever, uh, clever plot with that. Well, here's a former Husker that might be on the schedule next year. Uh, we were we were asked about. Uh, he's changed his name a little bit. We were asked about RJ Delancey, and I had to look that up. That's Ronald Delancey, former oh, yeah. class of 2020, played for Nebraska for one year, did not see on the field action, if I recall. Transferred to Toledo, played for two years uh, for the Rockets. Or maybe it's could have played three years for the Rockets. Uh, and then now is is being heavily courted, it seems, by Wisconsin. So, mm. uh, you know, the, the, the portal journeys continue. Deep into the career, it's like it's like the Tom Hanks movie, The Terminal, where he just gets stuck in the portal for like just stuck in in between. Never seen that movie. It's all right. You're not missing much. I, I don't need to run out and watch it. I would not. Is it a more feel good story than the Iron Claw, which I went to uh, yesterday? Are you guys I, I familiar with that movie? No. Uh, does the Von Eric brothers mean anything to either? Probably not. BC Brunts, maybe no. he's a wrestling guy. No. Yeah. Just just. Read the Wikipedia entry on the Von Erich family and just, yeah, that got turned into a, a movie released around Christmas if you want the anti-feel-good story. Okay, that's good. So, all right, uh, let's dive into things that people want to feel good about, and that's Nebraska's transfer portal recruiting after adding Dante Dowdell, the running back out of Oregon. Uh, let's just start there. This is Nebraska's only running back edition so far in the 2024 class. Likely will be their only running back edition. And uh, I don't want to put words in, in your guys' mouth, but for me personally, this feels like a pretty big addition for the Huskers. And I'm not just saying that because our Oregon writer referred to uh, Dante Dowdell as a massive human being. So I'm, I'm excited to see what that looks like as a running back. Uh, but I think this is a, a really important addition for Nebraska. What have you learned, BC? I know you just talked with, uh, I believe, his dad here earlier on Sunday morning. 
Yeah, it's his stepfather, uh, Lawrence Hopkins, um, who was on the trip with them. And um, I mean, they, as the Bruns likes to say, they checked all the boxes. Nebraska did. I mean, they they like the tradition of the position at Nebraska. I think that means something to the family um, that's well connected uh, to college football. Lawrence Hopkins, like, is it kind of in the industry. So he knows all about that stuff. And he likes that. Uh, EJ Barthel calls Nebraska the original running back you and they want to build that back up. And speaking of Barthel, uh, give him a lot of credit on this one. Lawrence Hopkins really cited him as uh, a guy that he feels can develop uh, Dante. Uh, Dante believed that uh, they like his track record. Uh, they checked around with other coaches to see what they thought of uh, Coach Barthel and, and he got good remarks from them. And uh, it seems like uh, he was really had a successful weekend with the family, sort of uh, showing what his vision is and also telling them the staff made it clear uh, nothing's given here. Uh, this is going to be a, a competition. Uh, you're going to have to earn it. And uh, Lawrence Hopkins said of uh, Dante Daldell, that's what he wants, that he's, he's a guy who wants to come in and and earn everything he got gets. He's not ex he uh, he wants to be the best guy in the room. He expects he can be the best guy in the room, but he's also not going to say it. He just wants to go out and do it. So that was the gist of that conversation I had with him. And he also likes to fold back uh, this new running back. I guess he ran behind one a lot in high school where he had more than um, – he had like 4,700 yards his last two seasons if you add him up. Um, and the, the fullback was blocking – uh in front of him and he likes that nebraska utilizes that some and so all that kind of appealed to him brunts as you sort of look at this what do you think the addition of dante dowdell means for that running back room i mean he's leaving a place in oregon where he you know was expected to be no better than third or fourth on the depth chart they use two to three running backs a game and so he was like right on the edge of where he would get a little bit of time but it was going to be you know pretty minimal and the people in front of him still had multiple years of eligibility. He ends up at a place in Nebraska where you've got a crowded room of contributors, but no one that's a standout. What do you think that means in terms of his addition to that room? Yeah. And I mean, the, there might be kind of the same number of cast of characters, that, you know, at Nebraska is what there was in Oregon, but I think there's a lot more, a lot more question marks at, at Nebraska. I mean, you, you lose Anthony Grant, you have Ramir Johnson coming back off of an injury. You have um, a back in Gabe Irvin Jr., who I think profiles size-wise pretty close to Dowdell, um, you know, as, as kind of that 215, 220-pound back. He's coming off of a major hip injury. Um, you know, you liked what you saw from Emmett Johnson last year in, in fits and spurts, and I, I think, you know, his development is kind of on an upward track. We – we know that the coaching staff likes Quentin Ives, but we haven't seen him. So, you know, it seems like there's a lot of opportunity at Nebraska for a guy that, you know, from what we heard at Oregon was just basically a talented back and a really talented group of running backs. And, you know, that I, I know that Matt rule said in December, you know, we like the running backs, we like the room, but I mean, they were always going to try to find somebody to add to that group. I mean, you had to, because, I mean, you saw at the end of this last year how quickly you can thin through your depth. And, I, you know, I, I still think a guy like Ramirez Johnson, he's still I, – I don't know that he's still seen as that every down back. I mean, I think he's still kind of seen as a Swiss Army knife piece where maybe you split him out, you use him in different different roles. So um, I, I think that's why the, the Dowdell edition in particular is huge because – it, it was a group that needed depth. It needed a guy that could come in right away and be the guy. And, you know, I, I think, you know, depending on how the injury picture looks for Irvin and Johnson, um, you know, he's going to get a lot of looks in the spring ball to go in there and kind of, you know, put a little distance between himself and, and the guys that were on the roster last year. So I think for him, it's a great opportunity. Um, and, and certainly, you know, I, I, I think Nebraska's really starved for somebody that can come in and, and be a consistent back. Cause it is, it's divine to Zigbo is the last thousand yard rusher they've had. Right. Still. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, you're, you're going on five, six years. So it's uh, you know, there's, there's a chance for him to come in and, and uh, you know, really do something, I think. Yeah, no doubt about it. BC, the 
the interesting thing to me, Nebraska hasn't taken a lot of transfer portal running backs. Uh, the one that I can think of, the one real transfer that I can think of is Marquis Stepp and another Pac-12 guy, another highly regarded right. high school recruit, four-star. Uh, he came out of Indiana. He was at USC for longer than Dante Dowdell was at Oregon. Uh, but when he got to Nebraska, it just did not work well. What what do you remember of the, the marquee step thing? Because it's the same sort of situation. It's a wide open running back room. Um, but what ultimately happened in that 2021 season is Ramir Johnson emerged by the middle of the year as Nebraska's you know best option as running back. Uh, what do you what do you remember of marquee step? Why do you think it could go differently uh, for Dante Dowdell? Well, I don't. I don't want to knock him. I, I just don't think w w once we actually saw Marquise and he got here, he was okay. And that was kind of it. You know, I, I, I don't think he was beyond that. And, you know, you hope Dowdell's just a, a, a better version of that. Um, as Brunt says, he's got the size. He's a impressive, you know, w with the measurements. I think he's six two two ten. Is that what it is? Uh, his listing. Um, so he's got that, that bigger back frame. I guess what I like about, I wrote this on Saturday night. If you look at Dowdell's high school career, um, and I know you can say, okay, what's the competition where he was playing in Mississippi compared to other parts? I don't know. But he ran for like 4,600, 700 yards the last two seasons. And I always, when I see numbers like that, I'm like, that's the way it should be if you're going to be a stud, like in college. Like you should be a, dominating that level in high school to that degree if there's even a possibility that you're going to be really good at this level sometimes i'll see a commit a running back commit in high school as like 870 yards his senior year or something and it kind of doesn't compute in my brain maybe he had some injuries but i'm always like man it should be more than that right if this guy's going to be a stud at the next level so i know that's really basic point to make about his stats and we can get into what the competition was like, but I love that he just like dominated at the previous level. And then I think you get the best of both worlds a little bit in this one, because you're basically getting a top 247 or 24 seven recruit from a cycle ago who had one year of seeing what it's like in the big time, you know, ranks of college football, what it sort of takes behind the scenes, watching it at Oregon um, and you hope he kind of grew from that experience, but yet he didn't get, um, too much wear on his tires from that year either. And so you're, you're hoping that now it's going to take off and you've got just a more experienced version of like, if you got a top 24, seven back in this class, now you got that plus a plus a little extra. So that's what you're hoping for. And before Nebraska picked up the Dante Dowdell commitment over the weekend, they picked up a commitment from Isaiah Nayer late on Friday night. Brunts, what can you tell us about the Texas Wyoming wide receiver uh, who hasn't done much in 22 or 23, but was an 800 yard, 12 touchdown receiver for, for Wyoming in 2021 before he had a really serious knee injury that pretty much wiped out all of 22. And then Texas, as we know, loaded at wide receiver, tough, tough to break in there. Yeah, no, you kind of glazed it pretty good there. I think, you know, what he did at Wyoming, he was a really big deep play threat his first year he averaged almost 30 yard 30 yards a catch you mentioned the 800 yards uh his second year there 12 touchdowns um was really good on deep balls um you know kind of you can say whatever you want to say i guess about pro football focus and the rankings and things like that um they had him as the number 20 overall receiver in the country his sophomore year um he was really highly ranked he had some some really good performances in the mountain west and, you know, where he really shined was on deep balls. I think 30, 30 or so of his catches uh, went for first downs. Um, he was really, a, you know, caught a high percentage of deep balls um, that season as well. So um, and then he goes to Texas, hurts his knee uh, in fall camp in 22, wipes out that year and then really kind of gets buried on the depth chart. I mean, he I think he played eight snaps this past year for Texas, he had one catch. Um, so you, I, Nebraska's kind of betting a little bit that he can be more of the Wyoming version versus the Texas version. I think you're probably going to see a guy that comes in pretty hungry to show 
uh, who he actually is and, and that, you know, the Texas years are maybe a bit of a blip there. Uh, he's 6'3", 205, 210, uh, really wide catch radius. And, you know, the, the thing I think that's really important for Nebraska in this sense is it gives you a veteran wide receiver. I mean, he, he, you look at the way the classes are right now, it's a lot of sophomores, a lot of true freshmen. Uh, Demetrius Bell is going to be a redshirt freshman. I mean, basically, it's it's Alex Bullock and you know now Isaiah Nayer as, as kind of the veteran guys. Garcia Castaneda is coming back from the injury too. We don't know where he's at. So um, th- that was a really important get. And also, they're getting a physically different wide receiver than what they have outside of Malachi Coleman in that group. So uh, kind of betting on a high upside guy, uh, but I, I think. The, the kind of trajectory that he's on seems to be a guy that's going to come in ready to prove uh, w- what he can be again. BC Brunt's kind of steamrolled right through it, but what what do you think this does for the uh, for the room, and what do you think the room looks like? Yeah, you yeah. you you pretty much answered both questions I had. On, <laughs> yeah, why don't, why don't you tell why don't you tell us what when was his birthday? When what year was he born? What I, day? That I don't know. I I emptied the tank on everything. What's I know. Zodiac sign? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Brunson did handle it well, so I won't say too much. Um, now, so the the ACL he had, he tore his ACL in the camp of August of twenty two. Is that right? Nair did. Yes. And yes. I from my I kind of backtracked through our archives and our system a little bit to read up on him, and it felt like um, prior to that injury, Sark really liked him, Sarkeesian. Um, like to the point where he was maybe in line to be one of their starters, I think, like as of that fall camp. And so I guess that's the part that intrigues me the most of all this, it, the Wyoming stuff. For if, if he didn't have that, we wouldn't be, you know, he wouldn't get the, the these type of opportunities. But the fact that he went to a place that has so much talent at the skill positions like Texas does, obviously, um, and he was right there in the top three or four prior to the injury. That makes me think like he's worth the chance here. Like now let's see what he can do. He's probably in full health. Sometimes it does take like a full year till you're really yourself again. And it doesn't shock me that he didn't just like bounce right back out there this season and dominate or anything, but maybe Nebraska is catching him at that moment where he gets that, that second wind after an injury that guys get and you're hoping so. So, um, I did think Bronze's steamrolling work was uh, pretty effective, though. So I'll I'll rest my comments on it ne- uh, right there. So you, you did it. You did it great, though, because you set this up. Because I talked with somebody who was very familiar with Texas in 2022 and familiar with Isaiah Nair and his camp, and he was the talk of the camp up until that injury. That oh. injury really took the wind out of the sails. They ended up having enough wide receivers, and they have they have really good ones but uh you're absolutely right i mean he was in line to be a starter um before that injury steve sarkeesian uh actually really liked him quite a bit uh, according to the person that i was talking to and um liked him this past year but they were so loaded at wide receiver that it was hard to get him on the field and uh he just wasn't at the same level that he was during that camp but when he left to go to wyoming to texas they thought they were getting a potential number one wide receiver and more than that and perhaps most importantly they thought they were getting a guy that was going to be a really big weapon for them in the red zone uh and that is an area where he could be really helpful for nebraska with his size that you guys have mentioned it's an area where nebraska really has struggled passing the ball in the red zone for the last decade plus basically uh and so to have a bigger receiver and it doesn't even have to be a six foot five guy that can jump out of the gym but have a big physical receiver that can create the space or can go up and catch contested balls. He was doing a lot of that in the practices uh, leading up to the injury. Uh, but yeah, you you absolutely nailed something that I wanted to mention, which is Texas was really high on him pre that injury. And it just, the way that he came back at the timing that he came back, he just got passed up by so many receivers. And if anybody watched, you know, Washington, Texas, they have talent oh, yeah. uh, on the outside. And so um, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that was something yeah. I had heard before he'd even committed to Nebraska. This is a guy Texas really had high hopes for in 22. The other thing is, I mean, he doesn't have to come in and be 
Trey Palmer necessarily like that type of season. Like if he were a Marcus Washington type of player um, prior to the injury where you, you know, you got 400, 500 yards out of him and the young guys come along with him, that can work that, you know, if that, that formula would be successful and I'm not saying he can't shoot for higher than that, or he couldn't be a lot better than that. I'm just saying um, even that would be a very successful addition as other guys hopefully really take their game up a notch in uh, 24. I don't know. I don't know if this is how statistically significant this is, but it seemed like a high percentage to me, but like a quarter of his snaps at at Wyoming were out of the slot. And then at least like, it feels like it gives you a little bit of like formational, you know, you can adapt. Yeah. Like you you can Mm -hmm. adapt things a little bit there. I mean, when you have a guy with that kind of size over the middle, I think that helps a quarterback quite a bit, but I mean, you can see where, okay, you've got Dylan Riola. Now you've, you, have stated that you want to get the ball deep. You want to take some deep shots. Um, th- th- this type of an addition and his strengths that he's shown in the past, I mean, it, it seems to line up quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, I uh, it's it's easy for me to, to see in my head Nebraska taking shots downfield. I mean, I have Andrew Ivins in the back of my head saying that Dylan Riola throws as good of a deep ball as any freshman and, or any incoming freshman or outgoing senior, however you want to phrase it. Uh, that he's seen in a long time. You know, the best deep ball in the class. Uh, Nebraska has weapons already on their roster and Jalen Lloyd, Malachi Coleman, and others that can get down the field. Uh, it's uh, it's very possible that if they can build this thing off of the play-action deep ball, they're going to be very similar to what Baylor did when they were successful under Matt Rule, and I think that's kind of where this thing is going to go. I do want to ask one Dylan Raiola, uh question here before we, we <clears> hit the break, but Brunts, I mean – we saw the picture of Dante Dowdell jumping over Dylan Riola. We know that he was on a recruiting mission when he was at the basketball game on Thursday uh, as he was sitting with Trev Alberts and uh, Jay, uh, Isaiah Nair <laughs> um, was was at the basketball game. And so what, what do you make of this? Because we didn't get to see a lot of um, Riola recruiting when he was committed to Nebraska, but he certainly, uh, he certainly stepped it up now that there's – transfer portal guys coming in and he's as visible as he possibly can be for this program right now. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's noteworthy for sure. And I, you know, guys coming in for visits talking about, I mean, Jamal Banks said that one of the yeah. reasons that he was interested in Nebraska or told BC this was that because, you know, of Riola, I'm eager to see what that looks like in 25 and 26. I mean, you got to think that. I think they're going to get some freshmen or some, some juniors, I guess, this spring that are going to show up because of Dylan Rail. Yeah. Really like do. wide receivers, skill position players want to play with a quarterback like that. It's a name, it's a talented name. Uh, and, you know, this weekend, I think he showed that he's a willing peer recruiter. Um, so that, that, that's all good. And now that you've got him on campus, um, you know, he, he's everywhere, which is a good thing. So, yeah, I mean, and it, we, I mean, we hit on this, I think, right around signing day. I mean, the, the one disappointing thing was that you didn't get kind of that peer recruiting juice in 24, but I think there's going to be a pretty strong carryover to 25 and 26. All right, let's, uh, let's take a quick time out before we answer this question. Why in the hell was Dana Holgerson in Lincoln at a wrestling match? How's that for a tease? We'll be right back. So, Nash Hutmaker... The Nebraska defensive tackle turned heavyweight for the wrestling team. Uh, wrestled on Saturday, and I believe a triangular is that uh, is that what it was? I mean, you had you had multiple different teams there in town. Yeah, um, cool. ends up with a pin. Really cool video. The the split screen video of the Nebraska coaching mm-hmm. staff and Evan Cooper completely losing his mind with with Nash getting that pin. I think in the first period of his first match against a, a collegiate heavyweight was really, really cool. One of the other things that came out of this, though, uh, it appears Dana Holgerson, former Houston, former West Virginia coach, at the wrestling match. What do you what do you make of this, BC? Yeah, it did appear to be him. Uh, There was a photo that quickly found its way through the 
Husker cyberspace and uh, it looked like a clean cut Dana Holgerson. Uh, I mean, like you got a fresh cut as well. Cuts are in right now. Yeah. 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 He Look looks like you. you. I'm like 20 years have, younger. We should have brought that up earlier, but yeah, he, he, he had the same thing going on that you do very clean cut uh, look. Um, but yeah, we uh, Matt Zenitz, uh from Husker 20 or from 24 seven sports. Uh, might as well work for Husker 24 seven. Well, he helped us out. Um, he confirmed um, Saturday uh, that there Holgerson is in talks for a role, um, a possible role on Nebraska's staff. Um, now, what that can be, of course, the imaginations danced immediately like, well, are they going to rearrange, you know, the chairs now? Could he be like a QB's coach, whatever? Um, that's possible. I also think it's possible, as we've seen, is in vogue now for some guys who have been head coaches to go be an analyst someplace for a year or whatever they want uh, while they decide what they're what is next on their plate. Um, and so that could be in play for sure. I would think, um, that type of, uh, role, um, that's what we know. I think at this point beyond that, it's, it's just like kind of a funny story that Dana Holgerson, who's been a head coach at West Virginia and Houston is right there, but you know, it could be because he's quickly going to be part of this coaching staff soon. So that, that would, I mean, if you do the math, that's what you come up with. And it's hard to like look away from that equation at this point. What if he just what heard about this? It? What if he just heard about this hut maker kid? He was like, I want to go see this kid. I got to see this guy. This is amazing. He's going to his <laughs> the, first they call, call, they call the polar bear. I want to see what this is all about. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's possible. <laughs> that's certainly possible. What other thoughts you got, Brent? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Um, you know, it, it, whatever that role ends up being, I think that kind of shapes the conversation. Um, if it's an analyst type role, um, he can certainly be valuable in terms of ideas and, um, you know, coaching and things like that. I mean, he's, he's coached quarterbacks in a number of spots. He's, you know, been in charge of really high flying offenses. It's interesting because I don't know that he necessarily like the heart of who he is as a coordinator doesn't necessarily line up with what the stated goals have been of, you know, what Nebraska is trying to do uh, as an offense. I, I do wonder if that picture changes when you all of a sudden sign a couple of elite 11 quarterbacks um, and what you, what that can be. But I mean, if it's an on field role, I mean, that's even more intriguing to me because um, you know, of his track record, the, like I said, the offenses that he's been associated with his own offenses. Um, and I, I think, you know, he showed at times a willingness to have a power running game with the, uh, the spread air raid stuff that, he, you know, kind of comes from that tree. So it's, uh, we'll see where it goes. I mean, I, I, you have to think it's somewhat far along in those discussions. If you're going to a wrestling match with the entire staff, like, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit of a public, public hangout, I guess, for somebody that's just in conversations. Yeah. I, I look at it like it would make a lot of sense to me if you were Dana Holgerson and you were looking for how to reset the the narrative on yourself or set yourself up for your next job to attach yourself to a guy like Dylan Riola and his experience with quarterbacks. And I don't know whether it'll be as an analyst or as a quarterback's coach or whatever the position is, but if he can get some run off of whatever happens with, with Riola and if it goes well, that's going to make him really admirable. Uh, in the next sort of coaching cycle, uh, especially, you know, if Nebraska actually takes a step forward as a program and and a lot of it is because they have this sort of quarterback uh, and you can be attached to that, it's going to help all of those guys. But specifically, if you're looking to rehabilitate yourself, you want to put yourself in a position where it's going to be successful. I think that uh, that could be a, a smart move for, for Dana Holgerson. It's, it is really interesting thinking about the offenses that he has run. Uh, relative to what Matt Rule has largely been. But then I go back to the kind of Rule's comment that he made on his own. I don't remember if this was at the end of the season or if it was a random Monday press conference, but he sort of like mentioned that if you look at, and I think it was in relation to, to Tony White to some degree, if you look at like his history as a coach, his defenses have always been good. And then he's, he kind of was like, and my offenses have kind of always been mediocre. And so, you know, there could be a, a little bit of a self um, scout there where it's like, maybe I need to do something 
somewhat different and bringing in a guy who thinks differently or runs things differently on offense. And especially as Nebraska attempts to develop their passing game, you could see where you could get a lot out of picking the brain of a Dana Holgerson. You know, if you're a part of this offensive staff, even if he's just an analyst, he might be able to add a few things that Nebraska simply either lacks the creativity to do uh, or doesn't or hasn't considered and I think that makes him a pretty valuable asset, regardless of whether it's on the field or in this analyst role. Yeah. And if it's an analyst role, I mean, sometimes I think people hear that they're like, OK, that's not as exciting. You can have a pretty big say in some of the ideas behind the scenes in a role like that. Um, and as you've heard Rule speak also at the signing day press conference about how he likes how the defense is a, kind of a positionless defense, right, where they can move all these pieces around and he wants the offense to be similar so you think of like guys who are coming in and some of the hybrid type players they have, whether it's a Keelan Smith or a Carter Nelson or whomever that you could use in different ways. Jaden um, Goss. Yeah, exactly. Um, those would be guys who Dana Holgerson, I mean, whatever his track record was, wins and losses as a head coach, he's been highly regarded as an offensive mind in college football for a long time. I remember when he was the OC for Gundy, um, at Oklahoma State, I believe it was in the they had the Two, game against Nebraska it was 51 41 or whatever it was. That was one of Pelini's better wins when you look back at it. Um, but Holgerson's offense at that point and uh throughout his career has always been interesting and it's evolved and been sort of dynamic in some of the ideas it has. So um if you put a guy like that in your room, whatever title you put behind him, that's always good. You just want to um, surround yourself with with uh, guys who have uh, had success like he's had as far as uh, offensive football. Absolutely. Uh, all right. Anything else we want to get to before we close up shop today? I'm sure we're going to be back. It's been a couple weeks since we've had a Husker 24-7 podcast. We've been focused uh, largely on just some basketball when we have been doing the podcasting, but we'll be back into a more regular rotation, I'm sure. This week in BC and I will be having the Husker 24-7 hoops cast uh, that comes out on Tuesday. We can talk about two wildly different games uh, for Nebraska between Indiana and Wisconsin. Uh, so we'll have that coming up. But anything else you guys want to get to this week? There's still the chance of Jamal Banks. Uh, Stephon Thompson uh, has been discussed as well. There's still some some potential additions. But it does feel like, guys, that largely this is getting turned to 2025. And when these coaches go hit the road here, uh, we're still a week, I think, away from that. Um, or – is it a week or does it happen this week? I'm my schedule is all thrown off. I think it's is it, coming, is it Thursday this week. Yeah, it's this coming the, week because they're uh, the convention AFCA coming. conventions right now. Yeah, yeah. So they'll be hitting the road here starting Thursday, Thursday or Friday. Uh, I'm not anticipating a lot of 2024s, but I do think they have really kind of turned the page to 2025. We know there's a uh, January uh, 20th, I believe, Junior Day coming up. Uh, Pierce Mooberry was telling me about it. Uh, they're, they're certainly going to be trying to bring in some talent, uh, for that, for that weekend, but it does feel like this is, you know, moving pretty heavily to, to 2025. Yeah. yeah. I, well, there's so, the value that they had too last year when they, during this like couple weeks stretch, I mean, that, they went and saw Grant Bricks, Carter Nelson, a lot of guys that ended up being part of the class. I, I think you're absolutely right that there's going to be more of a forward facing approach in these next couple of weeks. PC, yeah, I, I I don't have much to add. I mean, I I think uh, when when this portal process started, we knew the numbers of incoming guys would be very limited because it's a tight squeeze right now uh, with the rosters. And you know, at this point, there as we're doing this, there's three additions. That's about what I would have guessed. So if maybe there's one more, I don't know, but three or four is about in that probably wheelhouse of, of where we thought this would be. So there's really been no surprise on that front for how it's played out. Um, and they've, they've gotten better in some spots. We'll see if there's one surprise still, or one big announcement uh, along the way. But at this point, even if it closes down right here, um, I think they feel pretty good about what they've added. And, and, and like you guys say, it's what can you get out of this 25 class now that this staff has had time to build relationships as a Husker coach toward it. It's going to be an interesting cycle. No doubt about it. And we'll have all the coverage for you here at Husker 24-7. Last thing before we go, the championship game on Monday night. I want a prediction from Michael Brunts. 
who walks out champion from, uh, I don't know, is it Reliant, Allegiant? I don't know what they play at in Houston. Uh, who's, who's walking out? The Big Ten get a champion for the first time since 2014? Does a Pac-12 have their first playoff champion at the same time that the entire conference is being, you know, boarded up and discarded like a Kmart from the 90s and it's now 2022? Uh, what, give me Washington. Give me Washington. Washington. Yeah. Right. Why? Uh, I think the defense is just opportunistic enough. I'm concerned about their ability to stop the run consistently, though. Um, and I think I think Penix is going to have a good game. That's that's my prediction. BC. Uh, I hope Bruns is right. I think Michigan's going to win by ten. Ten. Yeah. BC with the the win and the cover. Is it close mm-hmm. at any point? Yeah, I mean it'll be a hard fought game. I mean. I, I, that that's a gambler question there. Like the uh, 10, 10 can be a close game. These guys who get caught up like, Oh, it's a four and a half spread. How dare you could say they could win by 10. It could just, it could be a three point game and a guy has a pick six in the last minute or something, you know, but yeah, it'll be a hard fought 10 point win. Yeah. I'm just checking. We're coming off of what a 65 to seven national title game. So I think I hope fair it. to, I hope it's I better it fair to ask. Yeah. Um, that game I made it three minutes into before just not paying attention to it again. So I'm hoping this championship game goes a lot better. Give me Washington uh, with completing the ultimate season, spoiling the uh, the Michigan Wolverines. I, I'm I'm kind of with with Brunson that I think Michael Penix has one great performance left in him. Uh, I think this Michigan team has not been tested as much, which is wild to say. They just beat Ohio State. Alabama, and I guess you can throw Iowa in there if you want to for their last three games. But I think that uh, Washington has played week in and week out a much tougher schedule. They've been challenged in a variety of different ways. I think the Oregon team that they beat was one of the best teams in the country, and they did it twice. And quite frankly, they kind of took it to Oregon. Like that second game never should have been close. And so um, I think they're going to be as prepared for a smash mouth football game in which Michigan can also throw the ball. Uh, and I, I like Washington to, to show up and win this game. And uh, I I hope it's competitive and I hope it's fun. I, I really enjoy those two semifinals. And so I would love to see a, uh, a memorable championship game here on Monday. All right, gentlemen, be sure to uh, to, to load up on the, the icy hot to do some calisthenics. Looks like we're going to be uh, scooping the, the driveway and the sidewalks on uh on monday as well a lot of a lot of snow allegedly in the forecast hmm. brunch your kids probably aren't going to school i know yeah, it's uh deep, per- deep per- sigh per- that nobody got to hear because he i know it, I'm, I'm expecting two days of continued yeah. break which is just great just great <laughs> right all right, for uh, Michael Bruns, for Brian Christopherson, I'm Mike Shaver. We're Husker 24-7. Be sure to check it out. Everything we have going on at Husker247.com. Uh, plenty of coverage of the transfer portal stuff. Plenty of coverage as we switch to 2025. Plenty of coverage of basketball. We got baseball around the corner. That's going to be coming up. You know, Bruns is, is working up the content there. So we have all of it for you. So be sure to stop by Husker 24-7.